In Gauteng and the Western Cape, this is Classic Business. Well, South Africa's 40-year-old Copyright Act is heading for a long-awaited amendment and just about everyone seems to disagree on the way forward. Uh, the contentious Copyright Amendment Bill is inching towards finalisation. Uh, the National, Council's, uh, National Council of uh, Provinces Committee on Trade and International Relations plans to complete its work on a B version of the 2017 Copyright Amendment Bill before the end of March, I believe. And that's according to a meeting that has been scheduled uh, and circulated a few weeks ago. And it also comes at a time when it's going to be competing for members' attention with the likes of the National Credit Amendment Bill. Uh, we've got a B version of the 2017 National Gambling uh, Amendment Bill. We've got a B version of the 2016 Performers Protection Amendment Bill and a B version of the 2015 Foreign Services Bill in the run-up to the general election. So a lot to keep members in the House busy. Well, to talk about copyright and paste in the age of Industry 4.0 and uh, maybe, oh no, if we're talking about the Copyright Amendment Bill, I'm joined now in studio by uh, Hugh Melandovitz, uh, partner at Spur and Fisher. Hugh, great to have you on the show. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me. Nice and, to be here. And I am just looking across at my screen to see, yes, we do have our other guests on the line, Professor Sadula Kajika, who holds the Anton Master Chair of Intellectual Property Law at Stellenbosch University. Professor, welcome to the show. Um, thanks. Um, um, hi, Michael. Hi, you. Hi, Sadula. How are you doing? Good, good. Thanks. And uh, we've also got Wiseman Nkobo, who is Head of Legal and Business Affairs, Composers, Authors and Publishers Association. Wiseman, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for having me. And greetings, Prof. And hi, Hugh. Hi, Wiseman. Right. It, right. it does seem in this industry there's so many various lobbies going around that everyone know everyone uh, but for listeners who don't have their noses in uh, the copyright amendment bill Hugh perhaps you can just sketch the scene for us here it uh, it brings to the front of mind the issue of the creative commons and supporting our creative sector so writers authors publishers anyone who's creating something original so let's just take a step back and find out what's happening what are the key issues here and how do we resolve them and clearly a 40 year old piece of legislation doesn't take the digital context into consideration. So just sketch the background uh, to what has been this far a very confusing build-up because we've seen almost more turnarounds uh, than we've seen at SAA. Okay, so Michael, I'm smiling here because um, your question is, was kind of what's going on. I think the crisp answer is um, I really don't know. Um, there have been a lot of versions to the bill and uh, I'm not certain which one we're on at the moment. I have... Uh, the latest one that I think is correct, um, but uh, every now and again a new version comes around. So the, the, the idea around amendments to the uh, copyright bill had been uh, uh, pressing for some time kind of to try and bring the Copyright Act uh, up to date and to take into account the di digital age, etc. Um, does the Copyright Act do that? Probably not. I don't think it really um, does achieve those goals, the goals of... of, of uh, um, bringing the, the Copyright Act up to speed. For example, it doesn't deal, in my view, uh, adequately with streaming. Um, does streaming constitute a reproduction? Where does that, that uh, fit in? Um, I think the, the other area as well that, based on my experience with uh, uh, dealing in, 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 co in the entertainment industry, there have been, as you correctly point out, a lot of lobby groups that have looked at various changes to the Copyright Act taking into account their specific needs, whether it's commissioned works, whether it's um, the situation that we had with artists who had sold their copyright and uh, didn't get the income that they felt that they were uh, entitled to receive. Th those are some of the issues that the Copyright Act was supposed to look at. Again, does it achieve the objectives? I don't think it does. I don't think it adequately deals with the concerns that have been raised by the, 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 the lobby groups. And f for me, there seems to be a bit of a, um, a, 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 a uncertainty as to which direction the, the Copyright Act must go, a, a question of policy. Um, should we be developing monopolies, which is what copyright does, it does create monopolies, um, and then look after those monopolies, or should we be opening um, our works up to the uh, uh, public at large? And that's the commons issue that you were that you were raising. And 
I don't think my, my, my reading of, of where we are at the moment, I don't think the, the, the policy has uh, been properly catered for. Um, I don't think the, the, the policymakers are particularly clear whether we should be um, creating the monopolies and looking after the monopolies or alternatively whether we should be breaking down those monopolies and, and opening it up for all. I think that sums up where we are uh, quite neatly, but it also does indicate just how uh, convoluted and unclear the situation has been when it comes to the various versions and who's actually drafted, who's advised uh, on the drafting and that kind of thing. And Professor, we'll, we'll get to that because I think this speaks to some of the issues around uh, who stands to benefit from this. One always has to ask with a piece of legislation, who ultimately stands to benefit? And I think you get a, a good understanding of, of who's standing behind it. But I want to turn uh, sorry, to... Mike, I just want to throw one thing up quickly. Just with the uncertainty, I've been involved in two transactions over the past, let's call it eight months or so, where international businesses were looking to do business in South Africa. And with the uncertainties of the, around the Copyright Act, they've decided not to do those, uh, not to, to continue with those particular transactions. Well, there you have a, an example of policy uncertainty that Correct. we talk about every day, uh, given effect to, to in no uncertain terms. That, that, that is investment that we simply cannot be turning away. Professor, turning to one of the biggest issues with the bill, it's proposed that we shift from our current system of fair dealing and that we adopt the U.S. system of fair use. What are the primary differences between the two systems? Um, yes, so there are two, well, I, I, I want to say major systems, but I don't even think we should call it major systems because essentially fair use is what you have in the U.S. And... I mean, as your listeners will know, the U.S. thinks that everybody should follow um, their lead. But essentially, the rest of the world has a system of fair dealing. And these things are really exceptions to copyright protection. So in a system of fair dealing, for example, the Act specifically lays down exceptions whereby if you do things those specified things in relation to a copyright work, it does not constitute copyright infringement. It's specifically uh, legislated what you may do. In a system of fair use, which the Americans have, they don't have a closed list of exceptions. It's sort of open-ended. They give you a set of four factors, and if there's a dispute, it goes to court and the court will ultimately decide whether a particular use is considered to be fair and therefore not uh, copyright infringement. So they are two fundamentally different systems. Um, the, the US, why they have the system of fair use is because they were latecomers to the Berne Convention, which is the major convention on copyright. Um, and they had... Uh, developed a system of jurisprudence for over a hundred years um, and of course they were loath to change. So these are the two um, schools of exceptions to copyright protection and we have followed a system of fair dealing um, which I think is more correct. I think it's more in line with uh, the Berne Convention which specifies that exceptions should be specific and that's what the fair dealing system does. It lays down specific exceptions. Um, as I said to you, the Americans have the system of fair use. And one of the so-called advocates of fair use, this is what he has to say, and I'll quote it because it's worthwhile um, hearing what he has to say. He says, fair use in America simply means the right to hire a lawyer to defend your, your right to create. And as lawyers love to forget, our system for defending such rights as fair use is astonishingly bad in practically every context, but especially here. It costs too much, it delivers too slowly, and what it delivers often has little connection to do with justice underlying the claim. The legal system may be tolerable for the very rich, but for everyone else, it is an embarrassment to a tradition that prides itself on the rule of law. I don't need to say any more if that's what an American says about their own system.
<laughs> but thank you, Professor Wiseman. I'd like to bring you in here as uh, as the head of legal and business for the uh, the Composers, Authors, and Publishers Association here, and obviously um, representing the uh, creators of work. Um, you're, you're looking for a system that um, strikes a balance, but but looks after the interest, surely, of um, uh, of those that you represent. But how do we ensure that we don't take copyright too far and in so doing end up supporting very large vested interests in, in any of those worlds? How do we strike that balance to ensure that we, um, that, that we, in a digital world, still allow people to use and to borrow and to share, for example, in the digital sense, um, a video on Facebook without breaching any laws? So effectively, um, the, the long and short of it is you ensure that the authors can license. And when you ensure that they can license on a fair basis, the usage will always be prioritized. Because one of the main things that creators of uh, creative content do is to try to share that content. But you cannot then take away their right to dictate how that content is shared and give it to mass users such as uh, the likes of YouTube, etc. So, and one of the biggest uh, problems with um, the way in which even the question you are posing is been framed is to try and create this false narrative that protecting copyright goes against public good, goes against usage of works on the internet, goes against, which is nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, entrenching copyright is a public good in essence. So when you give creators the ability to own their content for, by the way, a very limited monopoly. South Africa has one of the lowest um, periods of copyright protection, which is 50 years after the author's death. Everywhere else, the majority of the countries in the world have at least 70 years. So from that departure point, you give them the ability to create uh, the work and then earn for those uh, for their lifetime plus 50 years, at which point it goes back to the public domain and everybody can share in it freely and as uh, openly as ever. So without copyright uh, protection, without strong copyright protection, you then don't get creative content, which serves no one. Uh, Hugh, to to comment on that, uh, and I understand exactly what Wiseman is saying about ensuring that we, we compare apples with apples here, but as far as I understand, as fair use is applied, as long as um, you're not um, competing directly with uh, uh, the, the person from which you are lifting perhaps a quote or a phrase and then using it in a speech, uh, as long as you're not competing with them, then fair use applies. Well... Fair use is absolutely fine if you're giving credit to the author and uh, the the amount of usage that you have uh, in no way impinges on the author's ability to uh, um, to to get an income. Um, and I think that's really where I have my major difficulty with the with the um, legislation as it stands. Um, I don't think it really strikes the balance between the between the two and. I endorse. I'm not quite as uh, vociferous in my uh, in my approach to the uh, uh, to the dispute or to to the to the different views um, regarding uh, fair use um, as as Sadilk is. Um, but but I think his point is well made about the litigation aspect. And being a a, a litigation attorney, um, I am fully aware of the fact that litigation is is firstly um, really expensive. And then there's, in reality, no money in, in copyright, in, 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 in specific copyright litigation. We're talking royalties. Royalties are uh, notoriously low, and you really need either a whole bunch of works or alternatively a massive hit in, in order to achieve any income based on royalties. And, and to litigate on royalties is, is really not economically viable. And uh, clients who have uh, uh, had their works ripped off really struggle to to afford that that litigation and uh, um, the litigation is often as a a, a, a basic uh, a, a, on a question of principle and uh, there's there's a common saying in in uh, litigation attorneys that principles cost and i uh, agree with uh, with Sol Duca that uh, um, once we uh, um, have the courts determining what would constitute fair use i think the the artists are going to be those that uh, that uh, suffer the most at the end of the day um, Michael, can I just come in here? We're speaking about sort of almost the technical aspects of copyright. 
There is something at a higher level um, that concerns us about the Copyright Amendment Bill, and that is the fitness of the DTI as the custodian of our intellectual property laws. The whole process has been shambolic. As uh, um, you have said, we don't even know what version with a bill we're talking about at, at, at points. So who, um, Professor, that, just to and, interject and on that, who, who, who has produced, who's advised the, the DTI and what role well, is the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee playing here? Because I've, uh, I, I've seen some suggestions that it has produced more of the proposed bill than the government department, which is um, it, it has. strange to I say the no least. Doubt. Yeah, it, it has. Uh, you know, I mean, and this is the point. What lessons have we learned uh, 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 from this, and for me, this is part of the rot that we've seen in the the, the last administration. We we've heard about the Zonder Commission and the cost to the state, etc., of corruption. If this amendment bill goes through, I am like you said already, deals are being lost. I don't know if we are in a good state to quantify the loss to the economy that this could have in South Africa. Quite frankly, these proposals, which are far-reaching, are not backed up by any economic assessment or feasibility studies. In fact, what they're going to do is retrofit probably a, 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 a feasibility study or an assessment onto this nonsense. And surely, surely it would be open to challenge then because we need well, to absolutely. demonstrate the, 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 what they used to be called the EIAs, but now it's a socio-economic impact assessment. So. Yeah. Um, Absolutely, but the point is what we should have said and what I have said in, in, a, in a piece in the business day is isn't it time now for a comprehensive report from DTI about how we've come to this state of affairs? Who but stands, course, who stands to benefit? Can we, do we know who stands to benefit if we were to proceed with the bill in its current um, form? Uh, uh, people like players like Google and YouTube. And I mean, African authors and artists and content owners are already on the back foot when it comes to negotiation. This serves us up to the likes of Google on a platter. Wiseman, that's... It waters down, and Wiseman can tell you, it, 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 it absolutely leaves us, when I say us, our artists, our musicians, our authors vulnerable to the likes of Google. Because they have the deep pockets and they will litigate to their heart's content and, and grind our artists to accept paltry royalties. Wiseman, just in conclusion, I mean, that, that, that is the nub of this at the end of the day. We've, we've got the rise of streaming services, uh, whether or not you're using Google Play or, or Apple or Spotify or any one of those. And if you're a South African um, uh, producer of uh, content and music, and that's being streamed uh, from another jurisdiction, the, your, your rights are, are not adequately, um, as it currently stands in reading through the bill, uh, protected under the piece of uh, legislation as it is proposed. What are you uh, proposing happens from here if the bill does go through in its current state? So uh, the first part is we are hoping it doesn't go through in its current state because um, the bill, as it, like, it's, it, I think reiterating that is it's not fit for purpose. We we'll just uh, we can never be um, overstated. So what one of, of the main points is there's been a clear lack of understanding of how practically everyday copyright affects our lives and how it's governed on an everyday basis. So there are certain um, provisions in this bill that completely depart from everyday industry-specific practices and completely desecrate years and years of industry solutions that in the absence of updates, the industries themselves have thought of and implemented and they work. And there's also uh, no way in which you can align these clauses with, with what is actually happening on an international level. Because in as much as I release a song here today, people from all over the world can interact with it almost as immediately as anybody in South Africa can. And that's one of the things we need to be very cognizant of. In as much as copyright is territorial, the practice and the exploitation of copyright work is 
in a worldwide problem. Mm. And we should be taking lessons from what's happening in the EU currently, from what's happening even in America as well, because they are trying by all means to increase protection, not take away. Absolutely. And unfortunately, this bill mm. has used the interest of authors and the rhetoric uh, around the protection and the interest of authors to sell that very same interest to mass users. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for Wiseman. Very important uh, that we do uh, get to the bottom of how we came to find ourselves in this sorry state of affairs. As Professor uh, Sadullah said, uh, thank you very much, Professor Chair of Intellectual Property Law at Stellenbosch University and Hugh Malamdevitz, partner at Spur and Fisher.